Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join me in prayer. On my heart, imprint your image. Blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be, Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope's foundation, and my glory and salvation. Amen. I'd love for you all to make a mental note right now. If you have paper and pen or pencil with you, that even be better. Because you can visually and physically put it down, what I'm about to lead you all through. Imagine you have this piece of paper, and on it, I want you to write everybody you love. Starting with the top priority. And don't say, oh, Pastor, I don't have a top priority. Yes, you do. And don't say God, because you're a liar. That's not true either. God is not number one in your lives. Let's start with the people. That second part of the family, loving your neighbor as yourself. That first neighbor. Who would we, if we're married, who would that first neighbor be, hopefully? It would be our spouse. Just thank you, Mike. It would be your wife. Or if you are a woman, it would be your husband, right? We're still that way in the Missouri Senate. So, we look at this, it's our spouse. That is the first person in our life. Who comes next then? If the good Lord has given us children, we have our children. Now, I'm not asking you to number them and how much you love them and like them, even though it's true to a point. You all love all your children. Wow. Anyone have their coffee this morning? I thought I was pretty fired up. i got to get more fired up, I suppose. You love all your children equally, right? But you have the wife or the husband, the spouse. Then you have your children. And then you start expanding the relationships, right? But as you expand outside of spouse and child, you start loving people a little less, right? Parents, siblings, cousins, aunts and uncles. Well, grandchildren, but grandparents, they have all the love in the world to give, you know? But grandchildren, right? And then you have extended family, right? People you maybe never met before. And that's when the list stops being a list of people you love and starts being more of a list of people you just live with. People you kind of tolerate in life, right? I'd say that's probably the bulk of our list, is people we tolerate. Who would you include in that list, right? People at church, <laughs> right? More than likely, we tolerate everybody at church most of the time. Neighbors. Then you get into that bad part of your list. And if anyone says, Pastor, no, 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 Pastor, I don't have those people on my list, is those people you hate. Your enemies. People who have wronged you. And when I say hate, I, I, you know when you're a child and your parent says, don't say hate, that's a strong word. Say dislike. You know, from an early age, we're teaching our children that sin isn't a big deal. Because when you gossip about someone, that means you hate them. When you don't put the best construction on someone, that means you hate them. When you covet what belongs to someone, you hate them. Our list of people we hate, those who have wronged us, can be pretty sizable, I would imagine. But even think of those people we love, getting back to the top of that list, wife or husband and children. We do love them, right? <coughs> we love them sacrificially and unconditionally, but then think about it. <laughs> How many of y'all are perfect in love for the ones Christ has given you in your life? Perfect. This is the one time where Lutherans shouldn't raise their hand. Great. Y'all passed the test. I don't do it. My Allison was away at pastor's wife retreat for two days. What? I'll give y'all a guess here. Did I talk to my sons nicely and gently over the weekend? Or were the cops called because I was yelling so much this weekend? <laughs> this is the reality. We should love. We should sacrifice. We should have unconditional, that eternal type love that Jesus has for us, for everyone. But we don't do it. And then that gets into that chief commandment, that great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your thoughts. 
I'm sure I don't have to convince anybody this morning that we don't keep that. That is one we break habitually, constantly, creating our own idols in this world over and against the one who creates us. Repent with me, my friends, because we should love God unconditionally, and we should love our neighbor without compulsion or with the thought of what can I get out of this person. These two great commandments are our God's bidding to us to be creatures of sacrifice and devotion. That is our life as the baptized, beloved, is living in complete sacrifice for everyone around us. That is our life. Let us repent, for we have failed yet again to live in faith toward God and in fervent love toward one another. We've failed, beloved, for God creates us to live not for ourselves, but for Him and everyone He places into our lives. Now this morning, we, we can blame our sinful nature and say, well, I can't do this, and God knows this, I'm a sinner. <laughs> or we can point the finger at the devil, this finger, at the devil, and say, He made me do it. Or we can even pass the buck to our circumstances, right? Have you all ever done that? said, you weren't there in that situation. You don't know why I blew up. You don't know why I reacted that way. You don't, you don't know my life and why I do what I do. We have situations that guide our actions. But the problem is these commandments, they're not recommendations from our Father in Heaven for a pleasant life. <laughs> these commandments, these declarations from our Lord are requirements for us. In fact, if you don't do them, if you live in complete denial of them, you have what waiting for you? Not salvation, but condemnation. Oh, no, does that mean works save us? Yes, they do. <laughs> works save you. How do they save you? If they don't exist, it means you don't have what? Faith. Works in and of themselves do not please your Heavenly Father. Only faith does, but faith is always doing good works. It's always loving. It's always sacrificing. That's what faith does. It lives in devotion to the Father and in love for the neighbor. But faith in what? Is it just faith in God? Belief in the existence that God is there? No. But rather faith in the Christ. For remember Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees. He asked them, who is the Christ? And they say, a descendant of David. Basically, they point to his human nature by emphasizing his ancestor, David. Did any of y'all know this was one of the Jewish proof texts against Jesus? Was that the Messiah wasn't Jesus himself, but was uh, King Hezekiah, I believe it was. Was the one they said was the proof text. He was the one who was the descendant of David, not Jesus. Because they looked at only his human nature, his human ancestry. But Jesus then says that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus teaches the Pharisees and all who hear, including us today, that the Christ is not just a man, but is God Himself, the second person of the Trinity in the flesh. The Christ is both man and God. Now y'all will say, well, what does that have to do this morning, Pastor? We all know that. We believe it. We confess it in the creeds. We know that Jesus is both God and man. That is why the Holy Spirit inspired these two interactions placed together. For Jesus declares the law. He declares the will of His Father and how man is to be. That law hits us and kills us because we don't walk in it. We don't keep these commandments. But Jesus did. And Jesus didn't just keep those commands as a man, but as man and God in one person he loved his father with all his heart, soul, and thoughts, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Jesus loved without any thought of what was in it for him. 
Jesus kept the entire law that since the fall of Adam, every man has broken. Jesus lived perfectly and walked humbly in the commands of his Father. Now think about that for a minute. Why did Jesus keep the law? Why did he live the only perfect life in trust in his Father and in sacrificial love for all creation? Because Jesus didn't have to love. He didn't have to do all this in reaction to man's kind and love, mankind's love and affection. It wasn't like man loved so much that God said, I'll go down and dwell with them. The Son of God didn't become man because he knew sinful man would really appreciate it. Isn't that why we do good works? Have you ever noticed that? Why you and I do good things? It's because someone's either nice to us or we know someone will appreciate it. There's always that thing called reciprocity. Getting something in return. No. Jesus kept the law. And live the only God-pleasing life in order that he could give a God-pleasing sacrifice in his death on the cross. As St. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Remember that list of yours, my friends. That list we started out this sermon with. That list of people you love, people you tolerate, and people that are your enemies. Because you and I have them. And we do hate people. We do have grudges. We keep on to the past, right? Isn't that the best thing? I tell you, if I had a dime for every time someone told me a problem with the past, stop it! Every pastor always wants to say this in a sermon he doesn't have the nerve. Stop it! Stop bringing up the past for crying out loud. Someone sinned against you, you sinned against someone. I sinned against you, probably, most likely. Pastor Daniels hasn't had time yet to sin against you. He will. Try, sorry, Brother Daniels. <laughs> Tension off me. But the thing is, it happens. And what do we do with that? The devil wants us to hold it all up here. He wants us to hold it all in here. He wants us to bottle up that aggression towards somebody. He wants us to do it. Well, he can go back to hell today where he belongs. Because, beloved, Jesus has a list too. And what does St. Paul say here in Rome? We are enemies. But Jesus doesn't hate us. Because we break the law, because we've walked outside, but we are rightful enemies of God. Because of our sinful nature. Because of our actions. But God doesn't turn around and say, I remember what you did to me. He doesn't hold that against us because that list is overcome. That list that says enemy next to it is marked out in the cross. And there the word love put. Jesus loves you. The Father loves you. He loves us. And lay down his life, did Jesus, in order that he could be our rescuer. On the cross, he reconciled, meaning he brought us into a right and peaceful relationship with the Father. He paid the price so that we may have peace with God and one another. And this is the best part, beloved. This reconciliation is between us and God. And what that means is that God forgives us. He forgives our sins against Him and our neighbor. And that forgiveness isn't like our forgiveness in that we forgive and then we continue to hold on to things against our attacker. No. When Jesus forgives us, it means He holds nothing against us. It means He doesn't count our transgressions against us and condemn us because of it. That's what this gospel lesson is all about. That God loves us in such a way that He makes satisfaction for our failures, our sin, and in turn forgives us, absolves us all our apathy, all our aggression, all our hatred, 
coldness and selfishness is absolved in Jesus. Jesus absolves you, beloved. Blessed are you, for you're on Jesus' list of loved ones. Your name is written there in the blood of God himself, the blood of your Savior, Jesus the Christ. Be at peace. You are no longer an enemy. You are a loved one in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.